Designing Diagon Alley took us months of brainstorming, measuring, planning, sketching, building, painting, and decorating even before we could add our animatronic magic spells. It was like building an entire house before you could even start decorating it for any holidays. Many visitors asked us why we tackled such a gigantic project. Well, not only have we both visited Diagon Alley in Universal Orlando several times, but we were also lucky to visit the Diagon Alley project in Ballard over Christmas in 2017. We were impressed and inspired by such an elaborate home-built display, and we peeked behind the scenes into his garage workshop and how he stabilized his second-story overhang, but we didn't ever expect to have our own long driveway perfect for such a plan. Lo and behold, in 2019, we found our Queen Anne Victorian home with our own very long driveway, and our Halloweens were changed forever. We started our grand plans for Halloween 2022 by visiting Orlando yet again over New Year's for inspiration, research, and lots of photos, with Glenn practicing spells with my wand. This wand is, it is. the elder ish. Nicely done! You're a wizard, Glenn! We even finally visited Give Kids the World Village, a make a wish organization to which we have donated for years and that we chose for our Halloween fundraiser. We brainstormed which magic spells we wanted to do and could actually engineer ourselves, then selected which of our favorite shops would make sense. Our alley design itself began by setting out spare yardsticks along our driveway to approximate how far apart we could build the walls when the windows would stick out from the walls for that classic British window shop look. I sketched our plans at scale onto our Google Maps satellite photo of our yard, then imported that as a floor plan into a home design 3D modeling program Glenn had used before. It didn't have the full flexibility for design features like bay windows or importing images, but it gave the visualization Glenn needed to see, and it was perfect to check sight lines and even walk through the brick wall of the leaky cauldron. For more details and specific measurements, I drew over screenshots to make building plans. Then after our friend Charles gave his structural opinion that the triangular 12-foot tall pub should stand fine without a side leg support, we got out the six stage flats we built for our haunted Hollywood big screen and started building more 4x8 flats on July 27th, bolting them together in two long walls with support from behind by angled braces and ratchet straps around our trees lining our driveway. We had 20 days total of Charles leading our structural build, finishing September 28th, and some other friends were able to help as they had the time. I worked almost every day for two full months outside with or without Charles while Glenn was busy working his day job inside. I was even almost eaten by a tree! <laughs> We are so extremely thankful that Charles has all the construction expertise to build our Diagon Alley to last several months, safely standing even through some woefully windy winter weather. Starting to look like the plan. So you wait here until the pub has space. Then you go in, counter will be roughly like that. You have your butterbeer, hello, Kevin. Then, wow, it's diagonally, and then you go this way, and this will be built better. We're playing Tetris again with windows and flats for the second story out front, but it's starting to look like we want it. Yay! Hooray! Glenn insisted on using forced perspective to make the alley look even longer, so I taped the windows and doors larger toward the pub end than shorter and thinner at the garage end, but making them too small wouldn't be believable as you stood at the smaller windows and doors. I painted the first window frames by hand and quickly realized that wouldn't scale very well. The window structures were my design, with notches cut around vertical 2x6s flanking each window platform, with the 2x6s acting as extra front legs for wall stability. While Charles and I were working on our first window, Kevin came to help stain wands, cranking through the first hundred wands and taking home the raw supplies to take over as official wand maker. Each window had matching ceiling and floor pieces, 
mirror image with the second layer of plywood acting as the window pane stop, with the back corners of the platforms cut to accommodate the 2x6s, then 2x4 scraps as shelf brackets on each side and sometimes across the back wall, depending on the size of the window. Our owl shop was our test window, which worked fairly well with corner hinges on the glass frames so they could open to decorate inside the window. The hinge screws were slightly too long and poked through the plastic frames, so I used our angle grinder so no one would be scratched. Check out those flying sparks! I painted around the tape to keep all my window and door placement. Good thing I enjoy brush painting and know how to pace myself, since I sure did a lot of it throughout this project. Once the colors started going on the walls, it started looking a lot more like separate shops. I repainted the owl shop yellow, which was much more magical. Installing the second story needed Glenn with me to lift some of the full 4x8 flats up to Charles, but we got everything secured safely since it all stood stable for over four months. We found faux brick panels that looked fantastic, but they were press boards so could melt into sawdust if any rain, so I found matte varnish and spent a couple days completely covering the backs, fronts, and sides of each panel before installing them. I also painted the second story edges anywhere the brick panels wouldn't cover, getting a cool aerial view of our progress while I was up on the 16-foot ladder. Both Gail and Kevin helped me paint the lower walls under the windows and split window glass. Even scouring the internet, I couldn't find just multi-pane grills without glass, but I was able to find door inserts in the various configurations we needed, with dual-pane glass sandwiched between plastic external grills on each side. After Charles and I successfully split the glass panes along the adhesive, I figured out in 95 degree heat inside the garage that heat was the key to breaking the adhesive seal. So the heat gun, aimed by Gail or Kevin, made shoving my spackle knife and shims between panes of glass go much more quickly. I saved the panes of glass in a pile with scrap wood spacers between them in the garage out of the main construction path and did not install them into the window frames until very last. Only one pane broke along the way, so that's pretty good considering there were 69 pieces of glass to manage. The pub ceiling was probably the weirdest construction of all because of the triangle shape and the size of plywood we could get. Glad Charles figured it out. Kevin helped me install the 2x6s and most of the window platforms, checking for level and trimming platforms as needed during install, since not all the 2x6s were completely parallel top and bottom. The circular bay windows were shallow, so were stable enough with just those side supports, but the rectangular windows needed extra support legs to the ground. I was quite proud that my window structure design passed the Charles test. Kevin made Charles a special safety neon orange construction wizard wand to help with making all the straight cuts with his circular saw and table saw, and I was the jigsaw queen, cutting the round platforms based on the templates I had made from the window frame angles. I cut all the leftover molding scraps we had as the door trim for all the shops, with scrap 2x4s as plinth blocks at the base, and some crown molding scraps across the top for some doors. I got all those stapled in place and worked into the night installing the rest of the round window platforms to be ready in time for the painting party. On the last Saturday of August, we hosted a painting party, with a couple neighbors and several friends painting shops and staining several hundred homemade wooden wands, enjoying pizza dinner as their payment. We were very happy for all the house elf help that day from MJ, Sheila, and Kevin, Joe and Amelia, Louie, Benjamin, Rick, and Jerry. We planned for Madame Ollivander to hand out wands, but we knew we didn't have room for guests to enter a shop, so a split Dutch door as a counter made the most sense. Since pre-made Dutch doors are so expensive, we bought a cheap pre-hung interior door so Charles could cut it in half, and I researched and installed a latch to keep the upper door shut overnight. We added a thin board as the counter shelf on top of the lower door section, and I painted everything to match the Ollivander shop walls. I planned Honeydukes as the cornerstone of our diagon alley, with a fancier front than the Hogsmeade versions Universal has made. Yes, in the books, Honeydukes wasn't Hogsmeade, not diagon alley. However, my story was their Hogsmeade shop was so successful that they opened a diagon alley branch and made it fancier. We even made a roof and a porch step sturdy enough for Charles to do pull-ups. 
We saved those porch posts from the built-in bed we removed in our master bedroom remodel, so we were glad they had such prime real estate to be featured again. After work one day, Glenn helped me hang the eight-foot brick panels 12 feet high on the leaky cauldron walls, thankful for the built-in flashlight on the screwdriver. I cut the top of the brick archway after it was installed on the wall, but I was able to cut, varnish, and install the lower four-foot-high brick sections and the inside eight-foot brick panels by myself, making sure they were mounted off the ground so no water could wick up, plus varnishing all cut edges well. Thank goodness all that varnish work was worth it through the wettest winter we've had in a long time, since none of these panels melted, and only a few warped slightly in all the torrential rain we had. A major design challenge was how to build our shop windows with the classic multi-pane look, with different angles making circular bay windows or rectangles, and all these windows needed to open from the front, not only to decorate the window displays but troubleshoot spells as necessary, plus hopefully lay flat for more compact storage. Hinging the windows seemed to be the best idea, but getting small hinges to anchor well enough in the plastic grills was a challenge, so I experimented when my first windows arrived. It ended up that scrap yardsticks were the perfect shims yet again for the screws to grab since the plastic grills were only molded shells, not solid. Boy, did that take a long time to add all those hinges, making sure the edges were even and they were spaced properly, but the end result looked just right. Finally, by the first week of September, we had enough looking recognizable as Diagon Alley for my first public update, and we felt like we would actually finish before opening to the public on October 20th, but still plenty more to do. The attic boxes above the rectangular windows were basic U-braces anchored to the walls and the tops of the window platforms, then skinned with plywood that I painted before installing. The attic boxes needed to overhang the windows so we could hide the microphones and speakers for the animatronic spells, but for those details, you can watch our Halloween 2022 video Making Magic. The top cans for the curved windows were more challenging, requiring a drum structure of vertical wood braces with top and bottom matching plywood half rounds separate from the window platform so I could store them separately and slide them in place above each window. I made all my patterns based on my test hinge windows and cut all the plywood rounds while Charles cut, soaked, and screwed the wet fascia board sections into place at each side 2x6 to dry in the curves. Then, after they were dry, I took them down for painting and managed the rest by myself. We used pneumatic construction staples so they wouldn't be as obvious where I needed to paint lettering, but during final dismantling, we really needed screws everywhere after all, since once the curved boards were unscrewed from the 2x6 supports, they wanted to pop the staples. These were tricky to build, but having these curved shapes really sold our display as Diagon Alley. Even with the painting party and other help, I swear every other day I was painting something. I was very thankful that my trusty air sprayer was such a huge help painting the windows both before install and touch-ups in position. It created quite the modern art piece on scrap cardboard, but we went through so much paint that I even had to full price color match the oops paint that I had bought for Olive Anders and the pub walls. Glenn kept asking me if Madame Malkin's was my favorite shop. Well, I do admit that it had the most fun construction details. I had the lion curtain rod holders in my stash, so I built out larger brackets from scrap wood, and so many large cardboard boxes from all the windows were perfect to make templates. I got the arch and scissors looking how I wanted in cardboard, then used those to jigsaw the shapes from plywood, assembling together with screws. Charles helped me line the inside with fascia board while we were doing those top cans. Then I painted everything purple and chalked and hand-painted all the lettering while in place so I could verify sight lines. Fun fact, the arch fits so tightly on the lion brackets between the 2x6 window supports that the long screw into the wall stud holding the scissors was enough to keep everything stable for four months. To finish Honeydukes, I bought actual wood shake shingles, and Charles installed them faster than I could with his trusty pneumatic stapler. I had plenty still to do, making my Diagon Alley Honeydukes fancier, with front door and porch post painstakingly painted pink and mint green, plus those signs took the longest to paint. 
I installed the glass into the window frames using rubber and metal washers and thick, short screws. The smaller glass panels were fine on my own, even 12 feet high for Ollivanders, but Kevin and Jen helped me stabilize all the larger panels. By the end of September, all the Charles construction was complete with helping me mount the 12-foot-tall signposts at each shop. I installed the plastic porch lanterns, and Glenn wired them to low-voltage 12-volt DC converted backstage from AC power. Then we had just enough diagonally ready to film our teaser trailer that we released October 3rd, formally announcing our Halloween public dates. We had a couple weeks left for me to hand-paint so many more signs. For more house elf help from our Halloween cast members, Kevin, Sheila, Sid, Jen, Gail, and Denise, with painting, crafting, lighting, decorating, and even cleaning, and to add decor, props, and electrical inside the shop windows to support our spells for making magic. We opened our Wizarding World Halloween on October 20th as planned and ran 12 consecutive nights ending on Halloween night with our goal of 1,000 guests total left in the dust by day 5. We had to close the line early a couple nights when it reached a 3-hour wait by 8 p.m., but we still spread our Halloween cheer to over 3,700 guests who helped us share joy all the way to Orlando by raising almost $6,000 for Give Kids a World Village. I enjoyed redecorating all the shops as Christmas in Diagon Alley for seven more nights, with another 1,600 people bringing us up to 5,410 guests, with a grand total of over $15,000 raised for critically ill children and their families to enjoy week-long, cost-free dream vacations at Orlando theme parks and Give Kids a World Village. Huge thanks to everyone who helped us with building, painting, decorating, and designing Diagon Alley. Farewell for now, until our Diagon Alley returns for a future Halloween.